Shalom, and welcome to another episode in our ongoing series called The Life of Christ in Context. Now, already we've retraced the footsteps of Jesus from the north, the Galilee, to Jerusalem, and everywhere in between. And we'll do, of course, more of this as well in our sessions about the chronology of Jesus. But in this session, we want to focus on how Jesus taught. I think this will be an eye-opening session. So thanks for joining us, and let's get started. Now, in these sessions, when we talk about how Jesus taught, of course, we're not able to cover all of the details, if you will, but I do want to at least attempt to introduce you to a few ways of how Jesus went about his teaching ministry. So as we get started, again, uh, if you've been following this series, you already know what's coming because our goal is to see Jesus through the lens of the historical, and that would be the first century, the geographical, of course, the archaeological, the chronological, and the cultural or Hebraic background of Jesus. How he taught is uh, a category uh, that fits in there well. And then, of course, how he taught relates to his redemptive purpose. We use this term soteriological. So Jesus and his redemptive purpose can be seen in not only what he taught, but how he taught. And that's our focus as we continue this series. It's been humbling to have you along here on in this series so far, and I hope that you'll be able to join us for upcoming sessions, because even as we uh, talk about how Jesus taught, uh, you know what's coming, what Jesus taught, and even why Jesus taught, but there'll be more complimentary sessions that I'll include uh, as we try to create the context of Jesus' ministry, Yeshua, HaMashiach, Jesus, the Messiah. So how did Jesus teach? Well, we have to first of all talk about how Jesus taught within the established Jewish rabbinical system, thought, and practice. Now, I know technically the term rabbinical uh, perhaps uh, is a reference to later centuries after the time of Jesus, but I'm using this in a more generic sense, a rabbinical system. Jesus was a rabbi. There were other rabbis, such as Hillel and Shammai, two leading rabbis prior to the time of Jesus, and they all taught within a very Jewish framework. So that's what we sort of want to uh, try to grasp in our understanding of how Jesus uh, used these guiding Jewish principles and practices and integrated them into how he taught. Now, I am one who's more persuaded to think that, especially in the North, he used more Hebrew, although it would probably was a blend of Hebrew and Aramaic. Aramaic, a very closely similar language. But also, uh, we want to talk about other genres of how he taught in language, if you will. The use of kal verhamer, kal verhamer, it means light and heavy. Uh, Jesus used this way of, of communicating, communication, I should say. Uh, also, the use of what we call the fencing of the Torah. We'll talk about these in more detail. And then the use of mashal or mashalim. That's the Hebrew singular, mashal and mashalim, Hebrew plural of the word that we know, uh, parables. About 30 or so parables have been recorded in the Gospels, and we'll talk about uh, mashal. 
but also a few examples of what is called remez. It's a word that means hints. So take a look at this list and uh, let's dig deeper into uh, what all of these mean and how Jesus actually communicated. So here, uh, Lois Trevberg uh, wrote, the idea was to communicate a larger truth by comparing it to a similar but smaller situation. She's describing or defining what this kal ver homer means. Often the phrase, how much more, would be part of the saying. Now, was Jesus unique in this genre of speaking? Uh, no, he wasn't. Every rabbi uh, taught this way. But let me just give you a couple examples of how Jesus used call the Homer. Uh, we know from Luke chapter 12, Jesus said, Consider how the lilies grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the fields, which is here today and tomorrow it is thrown into the fire, here's this phrase, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? So Jesus takes a concept and sort of expands it, if you will. Here's another example from Matthew 11, excuse me, chapter 7, verse 11. If you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give what is good to those who ask him? So a small uh, illustration, principle, and yet here uh, Jesus illustrates how much more will God give you, those of you who trust in him. That's an example of how Jesus taught. Now, even uh, in Acts chapter 5, uh, this is what we read. Certainly, it's not uh, uh, a, an example from the life and times of Jesus, but uh, after the time of Jesus, Rabbi Gamaliel, who was the grandson, I believe, of Hillel, a primary rabbi who lived prior to the time of Jesus. Uh, this is what we read. Is Rabbi Gamaliel, uh, a lowly servant. He serves like a household servant, but there is one greater than him who serves. Consider Abraham, who served his visitors, but there is even one greater than Abraham who serves. You see, the building building of, of the principle. Consider the Holy One. Blessed be he who provides food for all his creation. So here we have an example of Chal Verhomer in the books of Acts. And then, what does it mean, fencing of the Torah? Well, you can uh, read along with me uh, how this is described. It is found in the very first passage of Avot, which is the Mishnah. Uh, the Mishnah is a compilation of commentary about the laws and commandments of God, oral tradition, if you will, and is part of the genealogy of rabbinic authority. Moses received the Torah from Sinai and committed it to Joshua, and Joshua to the elders, and the elders to the prophets, and the prophets to the men of the great assembly. They said three things, be del de deliberate in judgment, raise up many disciples, and make a fence around the Torah. Many of the rabbinic innovations were designed to protect the commandments in the Torah. Jesus used fencing of the Torah in his teaching. It was a very Jewish way of sort of protecting a truth or a commandment. So uh, when we read Matthew 5, this is a good example. Jesus says, have you heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. 
again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Racha, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the hell, of, of the fire of hell. So Jesus protects the commands, do not murder in this first case, and say, well, you won't murder if you don't even hate your brother or become angry. Because anger, of course, is the first step that would lead ultimately to murder. Jesus was telling his disciples that if they entertain anger towards someone, that anger can grow until it becomes verbal abuse. Further unchecked and allowed to fester, one's thoughts and words can lead to violence and even to murder. So be careful to control one's anger so that you will not end up violating the commandment against murder. Pretty straightforward, the fencing of the Torah. So Jesus used this in Matthew 5 about vows uh, in reference to justice. Also in Matthew 5, this would be the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, the sexual morality, do not look upon a woman lustfully. If so, you have already committed adultery in your heart. So protecting the commands of God, and of course, uh, mercy as well. So Jesus used this genre, if you will. This gentleman said this about fencing of the Torah. All of these passages typically begin with the words, you have heard it said, followed by a commandment. Then Yeshua says, but I say to you, and articulates his fence rules to safeguard the commandment. Jesus is not changing the original commandment, but instead he reinforces it by building a fence around it, and his fence, excuse me, is stricter than the original commandment. It's a good word by a Messianic Jew. Lois Trevberg also in her, from her blog mentions a, a very similar genre. It's called uh, Hasidut, Hasidot, I believe it's pronounced, Hasidot. The fencing of the Torah was associated with living a life of piety, later captured in the rabbinic concept of Hasidot. That word, I believe, should be piety and not petty. My apologies. An Orthodox rabbi describes the idea of being a Hasid, as someone who, by the way, the Hasidim are, are Israel's um, ultra-religious Jews who certainly have their own set of fencing of the Torah and their own set of oral traditions as well. But uh, this is what this Orthodox rabbi, how he describes uh, someone who, here it is, does not do only what he is told, but looks for ways to fulfill God's will. This requires intelligence and planning. One must anticipate just what God wants of him and how he can best use his talents and abilities in service of his Creator. So it's associated with keeping the law the best you can. That means not only written law, but in this case, oral law. Lois also shares the Sermon on the Mount was not a revolution against the Torah, but a revolution in understanding how to live out the Torah, the Hasidot. Jesus was not exhorting you to become stricter than the strictest, but to model your life on the character of God himself by living in a way that reflected his extravagant goodness. Hasidot was about going beyond the minimum and eagerly asking God the question, what more can I do to please you? That makes sense, doesn't it? Because after all, Jesus was inviting people to the kingdom, which was accepting the reign and rule of God in their lives. Uh, that meant a transformational change in who they were. 
Let's also now talk about the mashal or the mashalim, the plural of parables. Uh, this chart illustrates uh, some of the parables. Uh, 30 have been identified, and of course, we're maybe uh, familiar with most of these. But it's interesting that Jesus used the mashalim. In fact, I really am, uh, the first time I learned this word and learned how Jesus spoke like every other rabbi using the mashal, uh, Dr. Brad Young, I uh, believe, did his dissertation uh, for his PhD at Hebrew University, and he compared the, the 30 mashalim of Jesus, the parables of Jesus, with the 5,000 other parables that either preceded or were contemporary or followed the time uh, in ministry of Jesus. That tells me that Jesus was not unique in the use of the mashalim, but certainly was unique in maybe how he applied it, and we'll talk uh, about a couple examples in a moment. But uh, why did Jesus use mashalim is a, a good question. In fact, uh, that question is answered in Matthew 13. Jesus says, this is why I speak to them in parables. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or, or, or understand. In them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. This is the words of Matthew from chapter 13, but what Jesus is basically doing is he's fulfilling the words of what Isaiah chapter 6, verse 9 and 10 says. And Jesus said to his disciples, to you it has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, the, the machut shemaim, the kingdom of heaven. We're using those two terms um, as one and the same. But to the rest it is given in parables, so that seeing they may not see and hearing they may not understand. You see, Jesus is essentially quoting from Isaiah chapter 6. This is what Isaiah 6, verses 9 and 10 uh, say. He said, go and tell the people, be ever hearing, but never understanding, be, be ever seeing, but never perceiving, make the heart of this people calloused, uh, make their ears dull and close their eyes, otherwise they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. So Jesus taught with parables, knowing that some would understand them, and yet others would not. In fact, N.T. Wright brings up a good question. He ponders this question, and T. Wright is an Anglican bishop and pastor and professor, has written zillions of books on the kingdom and certainly on the resurrection and the importance of that. But he wonders this question, doesn't Jesus want everyone to get the message? Uh, Professor Wright says yes and no. <laughs> what he is saying is such dynamite that it can't be said straightforwardly out in the street. It is not that Jesus speaks in parables because he doesn't want people to understand. He speaks in parables because they refuse to understand. Through parables, Jesus can communicate with the people who are ready to listen, and no one else will understand enough to cause immediate trouble. It's an interesting perspective of why Jesus used parables. Dr. Klein Snodgrass, in fact, I would highly suggest his book, he was a professor of mine at North Park Seminary for the year of study back in Chicago, and this was, uh, oh, this was uh, a while ago, I should say. But nonetheless, uh, Klein Snodgrass said this, Jesus' parables presuppose and seek to disclose the kingdom of God, to explain the kingdom, 
demonstrate God's character and elucidate God's expectation for human beings to believe and act. A parable is an expanded analogy used to convince and to persuade. To convince and persuade. I would think that Dr. Snodgrass's book is really one of the leading books on parables, along with Dr. Brad Young's book on parables. So what are the characteristics of Jesus' use of mashalim? Here's the list that Klein Snodgrass offers. They are brief and straightforward, usually excluding unnecessary details. They are marked by simplicity and symmetry. At most, two characters or groups interact in the same scene. Another characteristic of Jesus' parables, they mostly focus on humans, they mirror the commonness of first century Jewish life, and their main purpose is to goad people into response. Fourthly, although they may draw on historical events, they are fictional descriptions taken from everyday life that do not necessarily portray everyday life. They are pseudo-realistic in that they can, can contain hyperbole. For example, the debt of 10,000 talents and elements that shock. Additionally, Jesus used parables in this way. They are engaging. Their intent is to elicit thought and require decision. So finding the implied question a parable addresses is key to interpretation. Next, since parables often seek to change one's thinking and behavior, they regularly contain elements of reversal. For instance, the Good Samaritan, he is the hero and not the priest. Next, like a punchline of a joke, the crucial aspect of a parable usually comes at the end. Parables, next, are addressed to specific context in Jesus' ministry, serve a, a specific teaching purpose, and seek to bring about change in people's beliefs and actions. They are not general stories with universal truths. And a few more, parables illuminate God, God's kingdom, and the new reality God seeks to establish on earth. For instance, fathers, kings, and masters are parables, generally are archetypes of God. Certainly the kingdom parables of Matthew 13 illustrate this the best. Parables frequently refer to Hebrew Bible themes, ideas, and text such as the Good Samaritan, illustrates the love commands at the heart of Judaism. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, Leviticus 19. Most parables appear in larger collections of parables, such as the lost coin, the lost sheep, and the lost sons in Luke 15. So the parable of the sowing of the seed, the four different types of soil are illustrated here in this relief, or the, the lost sheep. I love these images, compliments and credit to gospel images. I would highly uh, look them up. There's uh, dozens and dozens of these. Uh, here is one of my favorite uh, parables from Luke 15, parable of what we would call the prodigal son. However, I think it should be more appropriately called the parable of the compassionate father. And this is a good example of how Jesus would tweak a, a parable, and for the sake of shock and awe, he would change the ending. Whereas when the son comes back from, of course, he... Uh, the, uh, 
spent all his part of his inheritance. Remember, he wants his father dead because he wants his part. So he goes and squanders it away and comes back. And uh, we think that this parable is about the son returning, but really I think it's about the father displaying compassion. And this is a good uh, image of that. And of course, uh, the good Samaritan, it's the Samaritan uh, who shows mercy and cares for this man in need on this pathway between Jerusalem and Jericho. Or this one, uh, keeping your lights shining, the parable of the, the ten virgins. So the use of remez. Let's conclude this session with talking about remez. The word means hints, and my guess is maybe you have never heard of the concept. Uh, it means hints, like if, if I say Mary had a little lamb, I don't have to tell you what comes next, you're just, I'm just assuming that you know what comes next. Or, oh say can you see the U.S. national anthem, I don't have to sing or say the whole thing, I'm assuming that you know what I'm referring to. That's what remez means. In fact, I will, I hope, be sharing a whole session, uh, and maybe not in this series, but certainly uh, down the line, on a compilation of dozens of remezim, plural, remez, in the Gospels. Some would say Jesus used uh, 30 or 40 or 50. Others say over 200. So if we were to understand if we want to understand what Jesus taught, I think it really behooves us to understand how he taught. And he taught many times with using remez, the use of a part of a, pass, a scriptural passage in the discussion, assuming that their audience's knowledge of the Bible would allow them to deduce for themselves the fuller meaning of the teaching. So Jesus basically would share maybe one phrase of an Old Testament passage. We would maybe refer to that as sort of cross-referencing. But this is what Jesus did all the time. So I want to share with you five or six examples of Remazim from uh, the Gospels. Here's Matthew 11. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. This term, rest for your souls, is really a phrase that appears in Jeremiah chapter 6. Stand in the ways and see and ask for the old paths, where the good way is, and walk in it. Then you will find rest for your souls. Isn't that interesting? So if we were to imply what Jesus was after in sharing this remez, perhaps we could conclude that only by following in the right paths— of Jesus' interpretation of law, can you find rest for your souls? Now, I have to also just say a word about this term yoke. Not everyone would agree with me, but certainly, at least to this extent, there was something called the yoke of the Torah. This would be how a rabbi would interpret the law. As I understand it, uh, every rabbi had his own yoke. So is Jesus essentially saying, in this case, take my interpretation of the law? Because if you do, it's the only way that you're going to find, here's this borrowed term from the book of Jeremiah, rest for your souls. I think the use of remez here in this case uh, brings to light a, a deeper meaning of what Jesus was after. And uh, this one is an interesting one. Uh, again, maybe not everyone ag agrees with 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 this, that this is a remez, but uh, this is what Jesus says on the cross about three in the afternoon. He cries out in Aramaic, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, uh, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It comes from the first verse of chapter 22 of the book of Psalms. However, as we understand how people viewed the shepherding psalms, this would be uh, the triplet of Psalm 22, 23, and 24. It's interesting that chapter 24 
the last verse talks about God's kingship being glorified. Lift up your heads, you gates, that the king of glory may come in. So the question is, is Jesus feeling forsaken by his heavenly father on the cross, or is something else happening? I think the latter is the case, because even on the cross, Jesus was telling them, the crowd, the, those, those at the foot of the cross, that he, in fact, was the king of glory. I, I question, was Jesus feeling forsaken by his heavenly father at all? Because how could this be? Just the night before, <coughs> excuse me, he was saying, not my will, but yours be done. Not my yours, but not my will, but yours be done. He said that in the Garden of Gethsemane. So I believe that even on the cross, Jesus was announcing his kingship. In fact, that question, are you the king of the Jews, was asked of him in the trial period of Jesus. And as you know, uh, a sign above Jesus on the cross in three languages was placed, and it did say king of the Jews. So even in his most dire of situations, dying on the cross, Jesus was announcing his kingship. Here's example number three. Now, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been subject to violence, and violent men take it by force. Now, granted, this is probably a, not a, a good English uh, translation, but my question is, what's so violent about the kingdom? Of course, that's a rhetorical question. Nothing is violent about the kingdom. So how could we understand this apart from remez? Now, I believe Jesus is referring back to the book of Micah, chapter 2, which use, uses shepherding language. I will surely gather all of you, Jacob. I will surely bring together the remnant of Israel. I will bring them together like sheep in a pen, like a flock in its pasture. The place will throng with people. The one who breaks open the way will go up before them. They will break through the gate and go out. Their king will pass through before them, the Lord at their head. Look at this picture of the sheep pen here on the right, and you can see there's only one opening. The good shepherd, of course, so we read about Jesus being the good shepherd in John 10, but he would sleep in the entrance of the gate uh, here in the entrance of the, the sheep pen uh, until morning, and then he would step aside and allowing the sheep with great enthusiasm, with great quote-unquote violence, run out of the sheep pen. Could this be Jesus' way of saying this? Just like sheep running forcefully out of a sheep pen, as the shepherds stand aside, so will the kingdom of God advance with unstoppable force. That's exactly how the kingdom operates. Nothing can hold it back. And Jesus is using remez to illustrate it. Think of this picture. Jesus at the head, the king. And as he steps aside of the, from the opening, the sheep follow him with great enthusiasm. Here's another good example of a well-built sheep pen still used in Israel today. Compliments to Dr. Todd Bolin and Bible places, even caves have been used as sheep pens. So as the shepherd steps aside, here comes the sheep and illustrating the unstoppable force of the kingdom. Here's another example. Uh, this is in reference to children praising God. Matthew 21 says, but when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did and the children shouting in the temple courts, Hosanna to the son of David, very messianic a word of praise, incidentally, they were indignant. Do you hear what these children are saying? They asked him, yes, and replied Jesus, have you never read from the lips of children and infants, you, Lord, are called forth your praise. So what's going on here? Jesus was quoting a remez from chapter 8 of Psalms, verse 2. 
through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies. And here's the purpose of praising, to silence the foe and the avenger. Hmm, what is Jesus getting to in this passage? Could it be that since the phrase in this psalm reveals why children and infants offer praise to silence the foe and the avenger, Jesus was implying that the chief priests and the teachers were actually God's foes and avengers. Ouch. This was a a remez way of condemning these Pharisees and teachers of the law. Here's another one. John the Baptist there, of course, is in prison at a place called Machaerus. We visit Machaerus. It's in Jordan every time we we visit this country. Uh, But Matthew 11 says when John, this would be John the baptizer, heard in prison what the Messiah was doing, he sent his disciples to ask him, are you the one who was to come? Or should we expect someone else? So why is John the Baptist or baptizer asking this question? Well, Jesus uses remez in his response. He says, go back and report to John what you have heard and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. In this case, Jesus is borrowing uh, the language from the prophet Isaiah. Chapter 29, in that day the deaf shall hear the words of the book, and the eyes of the blind shall see out of obscurity and out of darkness. The humble shall also shall increase their joy in the Lord, and the poor among men shall rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. Also chapter 35, then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like a deer. You see, Jesus was implying that, yes, he indeed was the long-awaited Messiah, and what he was doing was on full display for everyone to see. He was indeed fulfilling prophetic scripture. And one more example, we call this sort of a physical remez. It comes from John chapter 8. Jesus is in uh, the temple, or at least around the vicinity of the temple, And uh, this is what happens. Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. In the law, law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. But now, what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. Now, let's just stop there and yeah, have you ever wondered what he was writing with his finger in the dust of the tile floor of the temple? Well, when they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time. They knew what he was writing, most likely. The older ones first, until only Jesus was left and the woman was standing there. So you you ever wonder what he was writing in the dust? Could it be a portion of Jeremiah 17? Lord, you are the hope of Israel. All who forsake you will be put to shame. Those who turn away from you will be written in the dust because they have forsaken the Lord, the spring of living water. Jesus was suggesting that the names of those accusing the woman in this case would be erased forever as though they never existed. Ouch, ouch, and ouch again. Jesus used remez to condemn these religious leaders. 
So how Jesus taught, he certainly taught remez, he taught all these other genres, probably from synagogues. We already revisited uh, visited the synagogue at Magdala. It's another beautiful angle of it. You can see the benches. You can see Jesus placing the scroll of the prophet here, and then maybe sitting down. Uh, the scroll of these prophets were read uh, by the itinerant rabbi, and everyone was looking at Jesus as they sat around this synagogue. And even at Gamla, once again, six miles to the east of the Sea of Galilee is this very Jewish site. It actually uh, dates to the first century BC, this synagogue that we visited in our last session, but here it is again. It's a beautiful, uh, preserved, beautifully preserved synagogue, and Jesus no, most likely taught here. Remember, Matthew 4, Matthew 9 tells us that he taught in many of the synagogues. And then, of course, on the temple steps, as Jesus would have entered the temple from about this area, entering into the court of the Gentiles right under uh, the royal stoa that uh, was a part of the southern section of the temple court. Uh, but Jesus, no doubt, taught here too, and how he taught about the kingdom certainly uh, was revealed. So let's return as we close to this wonderful passage in Matthew 11. Come to me, Jesus says, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Could it be take my interpretation of the law and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So all the way through the land of Israel from the north, the Galilee area, all the way to Jerusalem, and in between, even uh, here at the woman uh, at Sychar, at the woman at the well at Sychar, I should say, at least once Jesus cutting through the Samaritan hills, uh, Jesus certainly was one who taught with authority. He taught with smeka, and that's an important additional aspect of how Jesus was now perceived by those who came to him wondering what he was teaching, especially about this Malchut Shemaim, the kingdom of heaven. Now understand that many other messianic figures were rising up in the first century. They were primarily politically oriented messiahs, and yet Jesus was unique in that he was all about bringing about the reign and rule of God in people's lives. He was about to initiate uh, this kingdom of heaven, and he wanted people to take hold of it, to be transformed by it. And certainly, as we understand how he taught, using mashalim, using parables, and these other uh, speaking genres, if you will, Jesus was all about one thing, and that is to bring the redemptive message of the kingdom to people who were ready to listen and hear what he had to say. So this brings us to an end of this session. I hope you enjoyed this one, How Jesus Taught, and uh, we'll continue with uh, more sessions as we explore the context of the life and ministry of Jesus. So once again, thanks for joining us, and until next time, Shalom.